All right, guys, let's go ahead and jump into things. Uh, let's jump into our Tuesday webinar. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are having a good start to the week. And wow, 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 was there a lot of news. Well, I guess not a lot of news in general. I mean, there were a couple things, but uh, I don't know if any of you guys have watched the Brexit votes, the, the parliamentary meeting this morning, but pretty comical kind of felt like watching a movie it's pretty it's it's funny how i don't know i think i always find the accents a little funny it, it feels like uh like they're more they're more mad than than they are happy you know it seems like everybody was i don't know i don't know it's just very very funny if you guys watched it but uh we'll talk we'll definitely talk about that but let's go ahead and just jump into things guys we have a one new trade running we'll look at that in just a moment uh, a couple things to touch on. We saw some CPI come out for the Australian dollar uh, just a couple hours ago. Um, we saw a trimmed mean CPI, and then we saw a normal CPI quarter over quarter. Um, if you don't know, and I've definitely mentioned this before, that the trimmed mean CPI has a higher importance than the normal CPI. So we're gonna look at the Australian dollar in just a second. We initially did see a little spurt of strength from the Australian dollar. Um, I think a lot of that was mostly coming from the above expectations quarter over quarter CPI that came out um, at 0.5% and it was expected to come out at 0.4%. The trimmed mean CPI came out right in line with uh, its expectations at 0.4%. Uh, this morning, we saw consumer confidence come out for the U.S. Uh, US dollar. Uh, came out lower than expected. It was expected to come out at 125. It reported at 120.2. And then, you know, it's, what's so interesting, I don't know why they took it off the calendar, to be honest. If you guys have been following along and keeping up this week, remember Sunday's webinar, it didn't show the Brexit parliamentary vote. And then yesterday on Monday's webinar, it showed it showed it scheduled for today. And then I wake up today and look at the economic calendar and it's gone. So they took it off, but it still happened. Um, uh, there are a lot of articles posted on ForexLive.com about it. Um, there were a couple, and, and I actually posted some really good resources too. I'm just going to pull up one of those resources. So these were, let me see if I can go back to it and find it. Um, I just found it on The Guardian. Um, there are a lot of other websites, too, that had it. This was just the first one that I saw. But these were, you can see right here, these were the amendments. Uh, so these, I think there was one more. Yeah, okay, the S&P. Um, Jeremy, yeah, okay, there's, there's all of Corbin. I don't know why it doesn't say his name. That's weird. Labor, who was Jeremy Corbin. And then there was O, which was... Um, Scottish and Welsh assemblies. I don't know. There, there was a person, there was like a main speaker for all of these that they, that the, um, head of the parliament, uh, called upon each time. But yeah, if you guys are watching it, the, and, and this describes each of the different amendments, um, and overall it was fairly negative for the pound, um, it there the in yeah i mean that's just the best way to say it overall a lot of the amendments got rejected some of the amendments that were actually like more negative those got approved so yeah i mean you should you definitely should go through and like read through all of these amendments i posted the link this morning in the chat room for you guys to go through you could you can see all the different amendments what they go for um you can see like an example one of the um one, one important one. I mean, they're all important, but just to give you an example. Example J was extending Article 50. Those of you guys that are not aware of what Article 50 is, that's actually Brexit happening, right? That's actually, that's what Brexit is, is Article 50. Um, it says signed by a cross party, which means that there's um, going to be like a conservative side and a liberal side, right? Just just like in the U.S., if, if you live in the U.S., there's the um, Republican Party and the Democratic Party, right? There's always, with pretty much every economy or, and every, um, yeah, I mean, every uh, country, there's a left side and there's a right side, right? There's the conservatives and the liberals, the Democrats, the Republicans, the left and the right, 
whatever you want to call it, the obviously to have a, you know, have, have a, in, in politics, there's always going to be people on one side and want people to the other side. So there's the cross part, cross party group of, uh, re, remain minded NPs. Um, MPs, by the way, stands for members of parliament. Um, and I believe I, I have to look at the exact number. I think there's like three, or I'm sorry, there's like 630 or so. I think it's 630 exactly, 630 members of MP. Um, but anyways, signed, a, signed by a cross party, a group of remain remain minded MPs led by Labor's Rochelle or sorry Rachel Reeves. This would seek a two year extension of Article Fifty if there is not a deal in place by February twenty fifth. Um, I believe that that was actually you can see right here. Uh, yeah, it was rejected. Amendment defeated by three hundred and twenty two votes to two hundred and ninety. Oh, that's really cool. They actually updated this, I guess, after as it went through. Um, so it actually shows here which which ones passed and which ones didn't. Um, you can see this one. This one was, I think, the first one to pass. Um, you can see it passed by 318 votes to 310 votes. This one was pretty quick. This one basically states that the UK will not leave EU without a deal. But it says right here, this is this is a key disclaimer, or key um, part of it, is that it is only advisory and has no legislative force. So it's not really like backed or anything. Um, so, uh, you know, Brexit did not happen. Um, we're going to have to continue to see what happens. Um, we can actually see right here to extend, so Yvette Cooper, Article B, it was like the fourth one that came out, or I'm, I'm sorry, Amendment B was to extend Article 50, so extend Brexit actually happening. It says right here, what, actually one of the most closely scrutinized amendments and backed by more than 70 uh, members of parliament. This would guarantee parliamentary time for a, for a private member's bill drafted by Cooper that would extend Article 50 to the end of 2019 if Theresa May failed to secure a deal by late February. While it seems likely to win official labor backing and some from or in, and from some Tories, it could be uh, scuppered by doubts among labor uh, members of parliament in leave voting areas. The government will whip MPs against backing it and we can see that it was defeated. So yeah, I mean, overall, it wasn't looking too good for the pound. We really didn't see a ton of movement on the charts either. There was a one sharp little drop, or not little, like a, I think about a 50 or 60 pip drop. We can look at pound dollar very quickly. Yeah, I mean, this is the four hour chart. And then you can see on the one hour, this is where things moved on this uh, larger one hour candle right here. So throughout the votes, it dropped about like initially like 40 pips and continued to drop a little bit. And then it's retraced it's corrected a little bit of that move um, but overall i would say short term just from the pressure on uh the uh great britain right now i would say that this pair could be slightly bullish for a little bit but i really prefer and i'm going to be honest um there's somebody that actually asked in i know some people were asking you know is it a good time to trade and i really highly recommend i mean not just during this time either but like kind of stay away from the pound and just tread lightly you know if you're gonna take a trade on the pound make sure it's half of your normal risk right if you normally risk one percent or like if i was to take a trade which i'm not going to but if i was to look at it, look at it and i know and i know i normally risk either one percent or two percent i would risk half of one percent i would risk a 0 0.5 percent of my account um and the way you would do that on the position size calculator, just to kind of give you an idea. Position size calculator. We go to our position size calculator and we'll just put in a number, a random number right here. And let's say you wanna risk, you wanna normally risk 1% stop loss, whatever. Let's say your stop loss is like 50 pips here. Let me go ahead and pause that. Um, and then let's say it's pound USD, GBP USD. 
you can't put in half, you can't put in 0.5. You can't put anything under one in the position size calculator. You'll say enter valid number. So you can do 1.5 just so you ever know if you wanna do like one and a half percent or two and a half percent, that's okay. But if you ever wanna do half a percent risk, go and just see what 1% is, see what the lot size is. In this case, it's 4.68 lots, and then just cut that in half, right? 2.34 lots would be half of that, okay? It's because you can't do 0.5. So just something to keep in mind if you were gonna be doing any trading around, um, around the pound. But like I said, in my opinion, I would stay away from it, although I do think that the risk uh, is, the, if it's a more, uh, like there's better risk to the downside right now. Okay. Um, tomorrow is also going to be a very big day for the U S dollar. So one of the trades that we just placed that we're in right now, um, obviously it's on AUD cat. I didn't want to enter anything related to the U S dollar or directly to the U S dollar right now. Right. Obviously every currency is going to have some sort of correlation to the U S dollar, but, um, but yeah, uh, I, I didn't want to trade like a U.S. Uh, a, a pair where the US dollar was either the quote currency or the base currency. So that's why I opted for AUD CAD, which we'll look at in just a moment. Um, but just keep in mind tomorrow, guys, uh, the Federal Reserve meeting is uh, coming as planned. I think if we visit Forex Live, there is some debate on, on if it would happen. Let's see, okay. We can actually take a, okay, it says right here, Fed says the FOMC meeting will go ahead as scheduled despite the bad weather. Um, Federal Reserve FOMC meeting Wednesday preview. Um, another preview, we can actually take a look at both of these previews just to kind of go over things with you guys. All right. Um, if you're a new trader listening to this, if you are not familiar with um, FOMC, the FOMC meeting, um, uh, so the, F oh, it says actually right here, FOMC stands for Federal Open Market Committee. Um, it's basically, it's the committee that is in charge of the Federal Reserve, okay? The head of the Federal Reserve, it's a gentleman by the name of Janet Yellen, and he is, I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, it, I'm, I'm thinking two, two things at one time. His, his name is Jerome Powell. He followed the previous chair who her name was Janet Yellen, okay? Um, some of you guys are, might, might remember Yellen, um, depending on how long you've been trading for, but the chair of the Federal Reserve is, is Powell. So if you ever see right here, like it says Fed Chair Powell, that's Mr. Jerome Powell. Um, and they meet eight times a year, okay? Um, it's a very volatile time. Um, even when they aren't changing interest rates, obviously there's gonna be volatility. Volatility is gonna be higher when they do raise interest rates or when they cut interest rates. Um, tomorrow they are not scheduled to change interest rates at all. It's supposed to stay at um, the two and a half, I believe. Let me, why isn't it, where is it right here? Yeah, two and a half, uh, two and a half percent. And also just a little bit of education for you on the Federal Reserve. You'll notice if you use Forex Factory, um, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom left, it shows you all of the central bank rates right here. And you'll notice that for the U.S. dollar from the Federal Reserve, it's the only central bank that has a less than um, sign. You know, it's that's not just a constant, um, a constant rate. That's because this is actually between a 25 basis point um, deviation. So it's actually between two and a quarter percent and two and a half percent. That's why it says less than two and a half percent. So it's between two, two and a quarter and two and a half percent. Okay. It's not exactly at two and a half percent. That's why the less than is there. And they're, and they're, they're going to keep be keeping interest rates the same. There should be no surprise. Um, you can even see right here from Barclays, it says the FOMC is widely expected to leave policy rates unchanged at its January meeting in line with the more patient tone adopted in recent communications. It's something we talked about yesterday too, right? We, we looked at some news yesterday talking about the Federal Reserve tomorrow was most likely going to have an approach of data dependent, right? That was one thing that we very, uh, you know, I very um, put, I guess, what am I trying to say? I put some importance on it yesterday that, you know, I said that, that, that 
it's probably going to be a more dovish outlook from the Federal Reserve because they're going to be very data dependent on, you know, the future. And, and when they say data dependent, guys, we're talking about um, things like NFP. It depends on what NFP comes out. It depends on what like CPIs come out, what GDP comes out, all of the different um, economic gauges or um, – yeah, economic gauges, that's the best way to put it, right? All That's what everything is, right? Anytime a GDP comes out or a CPI comes out or a PPI comes out or a consumer confidence comes out or non-farm payrolls at the first Friday of every month, like we're going to see non-farm payrolls this Friday for, you know, it's going to come out the first Friday, which is going to be February, but it's going to be the data for January. Um, all of this data is what the Federal Reserve uses to change interest rates, right? Because what is any central bank's job? If you don't know this, you need to write this down, right? The job of a central bank is to keep a high rate of employment, right? That should be pretty obvious, and inflation at 2%, okay? Having inflation at 2% is like kind of that sweet spot, if you will, where spending is good, but the cost of good. It's like everything is at the sweet spot for the economy. It's like there's not too expensive goods where people aren't buying things, but there's all, it's, it's just, it's just a good economy. Okay. You want, you don't want inflation to be too high. Um, and you don't want inflation to be too low. All right. Um, so that is that let's see, uh, in this statement, we expect the FOMC to downgrade its characterization of the data and slightly to fine tune forward guidance to align with its pledge of patience. So all this, everything to me, at least when I read this stuff, it basically is saying the Federal Reserve is going to have a more dovish tone than anything. Um, also from Westpac says, since December's meeting, the market's awareness of global and financial risks has clearly grown and their confidence in the U.S. real economy diminishes every day that the Federal Reserve, that, oh, every day that the federal, federal government keeps its doors shut. So this is basically saying that smart money is losing confidence in the U.S. dollar, right? So what does this mean? It means that, uh, you know, we could see some weakness on the U.S. dollar short term at least. Um, FOMC official, which is what we're expecting. FOMC officials have focused on global risks to date. While these factors will remain front of mind, a more in-depth discussion of the shutdown shutdown's impact is anticipated. So that means that they're definitely going to be talking about, obviously, the impact of the shutdown, which was for quite some time, over, over three weeks. And it says, with many partial data prints unavailable, a March hike is clearly off the agenda. That's what I've also been talking about with you guys, that they're most likely going to be moving the hikes to later this year rather than towards the front of this year. That's something that we have talked about on one of the previous webinars. It says the market will therefore focus on what will and won't see the FOMC act from June on. Okay. So that is that. Let's see if there's anything else on here as far as another preview. Earlier previews here. Uh, Rainbow Bank, we no longer expect any. Oh, wow. Okay. So, of course, this is speculation, right? This is just one bank, uh, but they say we no longer expect any rate hike this year. The Fed's patients suggest that they are aiming for a summer hike. However, recent movements in the yield curve confirm our view that we are getting closer to a recession. Guys, if you have been following along and we've been talking about, let's just very quickly go and look at the stock market very quickly, right? Let's look at the stocks. All right, let's look at, uh, you know, just like the Dow Jones, for example, right? What do you guys remember me saying back when we started this decline back in December, right? What did I tell you guys? I said, we're, it looks like the U.S. is going to start to head into a recession. And look what's happening now. Central banks are hinting, or not, this isn't a central bank, just a retail bank, is, is um, hinting at uh, the beginning of a recession, okay? So connect the dots. Therefore, we doubt that the economic data will be strong enough to build a case for a restart of the hiking cycle. Uh, we expect the Fed to put a halt to balance sheet normalization. That's something we looked at yesterday in the second half of the year. Once the case for the summer hike has collapsed, and then we say, ooh, right here. And again, this is all speculation from one bank, okay? 
in 2020, we expect the Fed to start cutting rates, but probably too late to avert a recession during the course of the year. Okay. And that's expected, right? Go look at interest rate hikes from what happened after the previous, I mean, uh, what happened to interest rates after the previous hike, right? Um, go and look, go and go on here and scroll back to 2008, right? Go back and look at when 2008, the, when uh, the recession began, right? What did they do? We had the interest rates were all the way up at like, what, right at, at the peak, right before the recession or right at the peak of the recession or at the beginning of the recession, 5.25%. And what happened? We entered a recession and boom, 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 cuts, 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 cuts. Okay. So, and then eventually we got down to between zero and 0.25%, right? And that's where we were at for a while, right? We didn't, we didn't see a hike for a very long time, right? There wasn't a, there wasn't a hike for many years when I first got into trading, right? When I first got into trading in 2013, look at that, no hike for years. We didn't see the first hike until 2015, until the end of 2015. Wow, that is so crazy that time flies like that. I just remember that it almost seems like it was yesterday when they had this first hike. It's crazy that like that's that three years has gone by since they hiked it again. So wow, that's that's actually pretty crazy. So yeah, um, this is good stuff. All right, so just good stuff to go over. Let's see, we have some stuff in the chat. Uh, Jacob says, yeah, two percent is our equilibrium. Yeah, exactly, like our equilibrium. Uh, since we're over that, Fed rates are considered high. Um, I think only one rate hike under Obama. Um, let's see, Obama was eight years. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but I'm. Uh, let's see, like time goes by so fast. When did Trump go into office? In 2017 or 2016? Has time really flown that by that fast? Has it been? Was it 2016? No, it wasn't 2016. Was it? It was 2017. Um. I think there was, there's been more than one hike. I want to Google that real quick. When did Trump go into office? Okay, it was end of it was 2017. So then we can go and look. 2017. So let's see, 2016. No, oh, so there's one hike. Two. There is two hikes in Obama's term. It looks like two hikes. Yeah, two hikes in Obama's term. Okay. All right. So that is that. Uh, NAB, um, FO, FOMC meeting is likely to reveal too much new given. Uh, okay. FOMC is unlikely to reveal too much new given the recent round of Fed speakers who now claim they have time to sit back and review news and data. Okay. So pretty much, guys, if you should understand everything that I'm saying right now that overall it should be a pretty bearish tone for the US dollar. So we're going to have to see how things go with that. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into the pair. I don't even know why I didn't have that marked off. Let's go ahead and jump into the pair that we're trading right now. Okay. So here's AUD CAD. We are in this trade. All right. And uh, I think we, we entered a little bit early, right? We entered a couple hours ago. It's in a bit of drawdown right now. Um, I'm, I'm very confident in this trade. Um, here's also something that I want to, wanna, oh, let me go back to Forex Live really quickly. Something that I just want to touch on. I know some of you guys might be thinking, David, you're crazy taking a sell on AUD USD when the CPI just came out good for the Australian dollar. Well, Keep in mind a couple of things. Okay, one CPI doesn't isn't just like the this is this is a longer term trade that we're placing. By the way, right, we're looking to make 165 pips with a 55 pip stop loss. Right, this is no intraday trade. Okay, so that's uh, you know exhibit A of why I place this trade. Exhibit B is going to be uh, is it right here? Goldman Sachs. They're talking about. I mean. We don't, it's not even any current article, guys. We're talking about, you guys already, if you guys have been paying attention and following along with the daily webinars, we talked about last week, one of the banks, one of, one of the, well, there's four major banks in Australia. The first bank raised mortgage rates, and then the other 
three banks followed along. Okay, so it's not looking too good for the Australian economy. We're also talk. We also looked, I believe, yesterday, saying that uh, there's expectations um, from analysts saying that the next um, next time there is an interest rate decision in Australia, it's going to be a cut. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, moves that that point to the downside for the Australian dollar, not to mention um, the Chinese data, right? We've been looking, we've been watching the Chinese data. I believe we just recently looked at the CPI on China and it was showing uh, uh, weak growth. Um, so there's, there's, and, I, and I've talked about the correlation to China and Australia, right? If, if you guys feel lost on anything that I'm saying, like this just further proves my point of why you need to pay attention and you need to be here like every single day, right? Watching one of these daily webinars a day, two of these uh, a week, two of these daily webinars, you know, kind of just sporadically coming in and out, it's not going to cut it. Like it's, you're, you're going to be totally lost and you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm referencing previous web webinars. That's why I always say you need to be taking notes. You need to be here every day. If you can't be here every day, at least watch the recordings, okay? That's, that's point blank simple, right? It's like, how committed are you to learning trading, right? It's like, how committed are you to your success in trading? If you aren't committed, well, I don't care. You, mean, you don't have to stay and watch. You can be sporadic with it, then you just don't care about it, right? You just, it's, you, put, you put priorities into, into, into what you wanna do. So um, I've been talking about, we've been talking about weak um, Australia for a little bit now, okay? So on top of that, I chose AUD CAD. And right now I'm talking about the fundamental backing, right? I haven't even gotten into the technical analysis side, right? I'm just talking about the fundamental backing of this trade. Um, also from the fundamental backing on the Canadian dollar, I'm still long on the Canadian dollar, okay? I am still expecting the, this uh, correction on oil okay and i'll keep talking about it right because it's very it's extremely relevant oil is going to be a driver of a lot of our trades that are going to be coming up right even usd cad usd cad i'm looking to get back into also um in fact there's a small possibility we might take a usd cad trade this evening or tomorrow morning i mean I, it, it would definitely suck if I mean, it wouldn't like suck, right? I'm not going to like have any emotional attachment. It, it would be what it is, right? It would be, you know, it, it would just be kind of a bummer if we do see the Fed have this very bearish outlook on um, the economy or not even the economy, but just on future rate hikes that were expected and kind of pulling the reins back a little bit on raising hikes. Um, and we do see something like USD CAD fall, you know, because of the, this current strength on oil, but then also there's that catalyst of the weak US dollar. So USD CAD is still something that I'm very interested in for looking for sells in. And this is something that I posted, you know, we'll get, we'll get back to AUD CAD in just a moment, but it's kind of, it's already making its way down. I mean, it's nothing significant, right? It's moved like 10 pips since I posted this, but guys, if you're paying attention, I posted this in the chat room. I said two possible scenarios on USD CAD, right? I said it's either going to just fall right from here or it might go up just a little, little, little bit more. Um, stop out maybe some sell, or I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, stop out sellers that might have their stop loss just above this area right here. But I'm telling you guys, USD CAD still has downside. Um, and, and that's something I mentioned yesterday. You know, do I regret having that trailing stop loss? Um, and getting stopped out at like 132.70. No, right? We, we want to protect our profits, right? We want to, uh, we want to protect our profits. It's as simple as that. But I am still bearish on USD CAD because I'm bullish on Canada. Okay. So I think that's enough looking at the, te uh, the fundamentals. Let's go ahead and look at the technicals on um, AUD CAD. So um, I am confident in this trade. There's a couple reasons why I have my stop loss where I do. So you can see that my stop loss is above this structure. Uh, let me change the color of this too. Okay, there's so many reasons we're in this trade, right? This is just one of them. Um, so stop loss is above the structure up here. I don't think price will get that high. If it does, it does. Um, it is what it is, right? We're using good risk management. We have good risk to reward on this trade. There's a lot of technical and fundamental backing for this trade. 
and that's also going to be above uh, the a multi week high, right? So our stop loss is above last week's high, above the high from the week before that, and above the the week uh, the high of the week from before that. So we are above the three week high. That's actually also going to be above the monthly high. Okay, so our stop loss is above the weekly high, above the monthly high, above this structural high. So um, that's just shows that it's a it's it's a good area. Our my take profit. This is a pretty conservative take profit. I don't think AUD CAD is going to have any problem um, reaching lower. You know, like the ninety three area and lower. Um, I'm just choose. I just chose to put it at a fib level because that actually gives us a good risk to reward. That gives us a an exactly 3.0 risk to reward, right? So we're looking to make three times what we're risking, right? So we're risking 55 pips, and 55 times three is exactly 165 pips. Which um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't like I, I didn't go into this trade saying, oh, I want it to be a three risk to reward. I was focusing on where the 61.8 percent level was, and then. Um, I just, it just so happens to be exactly three, right? I wouldn't have been adverse. Let's say the 61 points point, uh, 61.8 percent retracement level was a little bit lower. And, and then we, it was a 2.62 risk reward. Well, I'd still jump into that trade because, um, it's still a good risk reward, right? The risk reward is above a one to two. Um, another thing is this, this is not just a new pair, by the way, guys, we didn't just randomly pick this pair. Um, if you were on the weekly outlook, again, this is why you guys need to watch the whole thing, why you need to go through everything. I, I pointed, we went over USD CAD. I, I'm sorry, AUD CAD. I talked about AUD CAD. This is the daily chart, right? We talked about, uh, was this, well, what day was this? Let's see. Uh, January 24th. That Was that Friday? No, that Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, that was Thursday's candle. Thursday's candle broke through this little ascending kind of uh, cons consolidation, bear flag, whatever you really want to call it. Um, we broke through it. We got a little bit of a structural retest. And then, of course, that spike today from the positive CPI um, has, a, has a little bit of bullish pressure on this pair. But like I said, ultimately, I think we're going to see downside on on this pair, I think the CAD strength is really going to be a big driver of this pair um, moving lower. So we've been we've been looking at this pair for a while uh, now. As far as specifically picking this entry, um, I don't. I'm not a the biggest fan of trend lines. You guys know that, right? Any trend line you see, I'm never going to draw like a trend line on like the 30. I mean, there might have been a time and a place I did in the past, but obviously every single year I get better and better. I'm not just saying year is in like the past 30 days. I'm talking like if you've been a part of the group, you probably haven't seen a trend line on the lower time frame in well over a year. Um, I really put the, the level of importance of trend lines. I really put that on the back burner. Um, I don't even know when it's been ages, like probably a year, two years ago at least. Um, but I do, I do still like to see trend lines. And I mentioned this on yesterday's webinar, right? Trend lines point out where, um, lower highs, lower lows, higher lows and higher highs are being created. So it's, it's okay to look at those. Sometimes, um, we can see that there is this descending trend line. Um, which is just something to point out. I just think that this is a general area where price is going to fall, right? I don't want to miss it is I guess what I'm saying, right? Is it a perfect entry? No. And that's something that I talk about in the course guys is that having a perfect entry, having that, like, I'll give you an example, USD CAD, right? This was a great entry, right? Last week when we took this at the end of last week on Thursday, it's great. It's, it's always a great feeling, especially when you look at on, on the daily, right? This could be considered a wick entry essentially, right? You get in on the wick. These trades are going to happen, right? These trades are a great feeling when you get in and it's that, you know, it's like that, oh my gosh, I got in a perfect entry, right? Even one of our mo more recent previous trades um, on the one hour on AUD USD, right? This was uh, uh, like the week before last. We shorted literally right here on the one hour. No drawdown, perfect entry, right? And then straight down into profit straight down like 30, 40, 40 pips into profit. Um, we ended up closing our trade over here in some profit on this bull flag, ended up moving up and going down. But you can, what the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, you don't have to have that perfect entry. You're going to have those perfect entries and then you're not going to have those perfect entries, right? Even USD Swiss franc, great example, right? 
this trade we got stopped out of last night, right? So we've been, we've been in this trade since last week, right? We got in this trade last week. Was it a perfect entry? No, we went through a lot of drawdown. We, right, and this was a 2% risk. Our stop loss is all the way up here, right? So it's not really like overwhelming drawdown or anything like that at the end of the day, but we still went through some drawdown. Did it end up going into profit? Did we, and yes, now we, we closed it at break even, so it ended up being a risk-free trade. We didn't make any money on this trade. We didn't lose any money on this trade, but the point that I'm trying to make is that you just do not do not have to have a perfect entry as a trader, okay? So in my eyes with this trade, could the pair, you know, looking in hindsight, even now, do I see that maybe we could have waited a couple hours and maybe jumping into this trade now um, or in, in a little bit? Yes, um, I definitely see that. But in my eyes, one of the bigger things that I'm looking at, and I, and I posted this chart um, in, the, in the Signal channel for those of you guys that are in the Signals, um, and if you guys are so confused about what that is, you just need to watch yesterday's webinar. Watch the end of yesterday's webinar, last 20 minutes, last day, yesterday's webinar. Explains everything if you're confused, okay? You need to, no excuses, just stay consistent with the webinars, guys, okay? If, if I sound annoyed, I'm not like annoyed. It's just like, it's, re it's really just like, guys, like, you know, I think some of you guys like don't take it seriously sometimes, right? Like you just see Forex is like, oh, Forex is there, it's there, it's there. Like I promise you in 10, 20, 30 years of your life, if you ever give up on Forex or you ever give up on just like your dreams or anything that you're trying to do, you're going to look back in 30 years if you're still in the same situation where you are still living paycheck to paycheck, broke, whatever. And you're going to look back and you're just going to be like, I should have taken it more seriously. I should have, I should have put in the time. I should have stopped. I should have taken that extra 30 minutes of where I'm sitting on YouTube or scrolling through YouTube or playing video games or going to the bar drinking or smoking the bowl of weed with my friends or doing this and that, like whatever you're doing, you say like, I should have been more disciplined in taking it more seriously. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now, that's exactly how it's going to go. And I, I hope each and every single one of you guys just stay committed, stay consistent with these webinars, right? You know, I see when these webinars fluctuate, right? Sometimes there's 20 people on, sometimes there's 15 people on, sometimes there's less than 10 people on these webinars, right? Um, I don't really care at the end of the day. I'm going to keep making money. I'm going to keep making money for everybody, but it's, you know, the people that are there are going to be the ones that are going to profit. But um, anyways, back on track. This is, I want you guys to look at these two boxes that we have that I have marked off. Okay. And this is one importance that you need to understand that, um, price tends price action in the markets tend to repeat themselves. And I'm talking about like on the same pairs. Okay. So it's important to watch price action, um, watch price action patterns when they develop, especially very complex patterns, right? These two patterns that are pretty much the exact same as each other. If you look at them, this pattern right here is almost a two month pattern, right? And we're seeing that same pattern form, that same pattern that took 60 days to form happening again. So that leads me to believe that we're probably going to see something like this happen fairly soon. Okay. And what do we see? We see a bit, a bit of a rally little bit of a correction, another rally, and then another correction, another rally, correction, or, and then it starts to dip, right? Breaks that higher low that it made, right? Turning this into a head and shoulders, and then drops, and then tapers off for a couple of weeks, um, consolidates, and then finally ends up dropping, okay? What do we literally see here, guys? Rally, correction, rally, correction, a little bit of a rally. We end up breaking that higher low, right? This one's a little bit more complex, a little bit different, but then we end up having that drop and then we have that consolidation. Okay. Do you guys see that, that there's literally two patterns that almost are identical to each other, but each took their own independent 60 day period. This one is actually a little bit longer. The current one we're, we're past 60 days. I believe when I was looking at it, you know, we're just past 60 days. We're like oh, a little bit over two months, but the, it's, they're very reminiscent of each other. So, um, you know, what, what do you guys, what have you guys been told before? Right. And this is true. Price action creates a story, right? Um, patterns tell a story. And so that's another reason why I wanted to jump into this. And I wasn't too concerned with getting the most perfect entry because I have a very good feeling that we're going to see, um, price 
uh, you know, follow this a very, very similar pattern here. Okay. Um, also you can see just one thing I noticed our entry was also off of on the daily here. Um, this isn't why I picked my entry by the way, by no means. It's just, I just wanted to get in. I didn't really care exactly if I got in right here or right here and right here. Should I maybe put a little bit more care on that? You know, could like, like I already said, in hindsight, could I have made a, maybe made a better entry? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're 10 pips in drawdown. I don't care about it, right? We're 2% we're risk, 10 pips in drawdown on a 55 pip stop loss. It's not the end of the world if you don't get the most perfect entry, okay? And then here's, uh, this is also something that we got in right around the 50 EMA as well. Um, 50 EMA on the daily, right? So 50 daily exponential moving average, right? I've already mentioned this. I prefer, and this is something I talk about on, on the course too, but again, I've said this and I'll say this again. I prefer exponential moving averages over simple moving averages, right? Everybody's always like EMA, SMA, because EMA puts a higher weight on the more current data, right? Data that's closer to now, whereas SMAs, it's equally weighted data over the, that full like 50 day period, okay? So the moving averages are gonna look a little bit different than each other. Um, and also like in hindsight, I do see that if we were to measure, because you can kind of see, right? We have this, this push up, a little bit of a bull flag that happens, and then this other push up here. If we look at a more of an ideal entry, I think it's kind of right around now because we have like about a 60 pip uh, bull flag right here, or 60, 60 pip flag pull, and we're just not quite at that 60 pips. We still have about another 10 pips or so. So that's why I'm not surprised, right? If AUD CAD keeps going a little bit, we go into a, like a, another 10 pips of drawdown or so, I won't be surprised, right? It'll, it'll all make perfect sense. Um, also, if we look at our expansions, um, I think that's around the 100% too. I think that'd be right around the 100%. Let's see, would that be 60 pips? Let's go ahead and measure that. I mean, it has to be, right? Because it's the expansion. It's actually a little bit more than that because I forget we're going to the top of this, okay? It's 100, yeah, or I'm sorry, 75 pips. So we could even go up a little bit higher, right? We could definitely go up another like 10 pips of drawdown before um, moving lower. So that's why I have my stop loss where I do because I want my stop loss to be out of, um, out of the way, all right? So I, and that's, oh, did I just, hold on, I'm gonna have to go back a second. I accidentally just deleted the trade Okay, there we go. And I will go ahead and just lock this for now. Okay. So that is that, guys. Uh, that is AUD CAD. All right. So that's the pair that we're in. Let's see. We have a couple things in the chat. We got uh, Jacob said, uh, Louis said the Bank of Australia declined 50% of mortgage applications over 5% the year prior above the three week high. That's a pretty setup. Um, oh, okay, okay, I see. That's two separate things. Over 5% the year prior, and then you say above the three-week high, that's a pretty setup. Yes, absolutely. Um, iPhone says, if I enter UCAD now, what would be a good stop loss, good take profit? I mean, same stop loss, right? Same stop loss, same, same take profit, right? You're just gonna get a little bit better risk to reward, right? So you just would go right here. You would look at like, if you were to enter now, Boom. And then you would have a stop loss. So your stop loss would be 45 pips instead of 55 pips and then same take profit, right? So instead of 165 pips, you're looking for 175 pips. So you get a little bit better risk reward. You get a 3.9 risk reward. Well, I have a three risk reward, okay? Um, not AUD CAD, USD CAD. Well, uh, if you enter it now, what would be a good stop loss? I mean, I'm not, I'm not interested in trading USD CAD right now. If I was to take a trade on, I mean, I, I don't have an opinion on USD CAD right now because I'm not interested in trading it, but I would put it probably above uh, the last week's highs. That would make the most amount of sense last week's highs and uh, you know, take profit. There's no reason to change, to have a different take profit than the take profit that I'm already looking at, right? Right around 129. Okay. So that is USD CAD, um, AUD USD, NZD USD. Um, so yesterday on AUD USD and NZD USD, I mentioned on the week or on the daily webinar yesterday 
that these pairs would be good for some short-term upside. And they initially were. Actually, if you look at where yesterday's webinar was, which is this one-hour candle right here, they did have a little bit of upside, not much over the next couple hours. I mean, not much at all, like only like 10 pips higher. Um, it really didn't move a whole lot. Um, I told you guys what would invalidate it is a close below the weekly pivot. We didn't get that close and now it's moving up a little bit higher. You know, it, it wouldn't really make sense for me right now to have a long bias on AUD, USD or NZD, USD, especially because um, I'm selling AUD CAD. So I'm going to go back to the sidelines on both of these pairs. I'm actually going to unmark these. I'm not interested in AUD, USD or NZD, USD anymore. Um, just because of the consolidation, even on NZD USD, right? It's really, really struggling to break this resistance. We got a little bit of a lower high created here. So there's some argument for downside as well. So I'm definitely on the sidelines with that. Gold, I told you guys, gold is probably going to go bullish and probably continue moving higher. We talked about it breaking the 1300 level and moving higher. So gold is following our analysis perfectly. Um, Euro USD, really no move movement, right? Yes, between yesterday's webinar, today's webinar, even the weekly outlook, not a whole lot of movement at all on Euro USD. It's inching higher, and that's expected, right? I already told you guys my outlook for Euro USD is something along the lines of that. Okay, something along the lines of that. Um, neither pound pairs I'm interested in right now. Dollar yen, I've already told you guys, dollar yen. I'm looking for some shorts on dollar yen, definitely wanting to catch a couple hundred pit move on this, but not too convinced yet. Um, maybe a sell stop, maybe like a pending order below the weekly lows isn't too bad, but you know, there's, there, it, it looks like there's a lot of good setups in the markets right now, right? There's UJ, USD CAD, AUD CAD, lots of, lots of decent setups to look at right now. And that's gonna be it, guys. You know, I'm, I'm not going to look at any other pairs right now. That's, I mean, we have a, enough on our plate. We have, we're already in, in another trade. Um, I'm a quality over quantity kind of trader, guys. This is actually pretty exceptional having this many trades already, um, like, going because, actually, I guess it's not, right? It's, we have two trades that we carried over from last week. But as, like, around five trades, um, if we can get up to 10 trades in a month, that's great. But five trades pays the bills. All right, five trades, five quality trades pays the bills for me. Five to 10 average pays the bills. I'm not about hopping in a trade every single day, every single hour, scalping the market, this and that, right? Find some quality trades, use some good risk to reward, good risk management on those trades, and let them do their thing, preferably basing them off of the higher time frames. That's how I trade, okay? Um, Jacob says, and that tighter stop loss with the same risk equals a slightly higher lot size equals more profits. Absolutely. Right. You would, because you're so for, um, for, for, for AUD CAD, you know, having an entry. Oh, what happened? Oh, wait, that's AUD USD on AUD CAD, right? Getting a, getting a later entry. That's the advantage of getting an entry when, when you're already in drawdown, right? You get a better risk to reward, right? You get a four risk to 3.9, basically four risk to reward. So you're going to make, you know, four times what you're risking rather than three times what you're risking. So if you're risking 2%, I'd make 6%, you know, a 2% risk on an entry now would make 8%, right? But do not compound guys. Definitely heed my warning. Okay. Do not compound. If you're already in this trade, do not ever double up on a trade when you're in drawdown. Okay, ever, ever, ever. That is a huge rookie mistake, okay? Straight noob moves if you are doubling down or re-entering a trade when you're in drawdown, okay? You only compound a trade when you're in profit, okay? That's something that's covered in the course too. We really haven't gotten like a lot of opportunities to compound recently, especially with the kind of way that I've been trading um, on this higher time frame trading, I really haven't seen too many opportunities to compound. But guys, compounding is a whole nother thing, okay? You only compound winning trades. You never compound a losing trade, ever, 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 okay? The saying, losers average losers, absolutely. Yeah. Don't, don't ever try to like cover your trade. You know, let's say you take a sell right here. 
Like that would be a to that would have been like totally something I would have done in the beginning, right? I, like of my trading, like five years ago, I take a sell on AUD CAD right here, and then I see it all the way up here, and I'm like, oh my, oh, I'm gonna get a better entry on AUD CAD. I'm gonna sell right now, and I'm gonna sell with the same loss size. I'm gonna double my risk. No, because if it keeps going higher, then what happens? Like, it's, you know, who's the smart one then? when it goes all the way up to the stop loss, right? This isn't a guaranteed trade. That's the thing they have to understand, right? Trading is a game of probability, right? It's all about having the odds in your favor and using good risk management. If you double down on a trade, you're completely removing that element of proper risk management and you're immediately allowing your emotions to do the trading for you, right? Because you're allowing your emotions to control your brain to say, Oh, well, I can make more money now, right? That thought right there, that act is what you have to discipline, okay? That you have to understand that patience is key and that you just let this trade do its thing. And if it hits a stop loss, you take the L, you accept it, and you move forward knowing that you followed a plan, you followed your discipline of using good risk management, okay? Or you do the latter and you take the double risk and then you end up losing twice as much or maybe more because you allow your emotions to control you right and then what does that lead to that leads to revenge trading right and then on the next trade you're like oh wow you know i originally went into that trade with two percent risk i should have just you know i should have just listened to david or i should have listened to myself and not double down on the risk right and now i lost four percent or five percent on my account because i doubled that so on this next trade I need to risk 5% or 10% of my trades. So that way I can make my profits back, right? That's called revenge trading. And then what happens when you lose that trade? Because you let your emotions control your revenge trade. Now you're down 15% on your account, right? And then what happens, right? Then you're like, then risk management goes out the door. You're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, screw it. I'm already down. I'm already down 15%. You know, I'm already down so much on my account. Screw the risk management, screw the position size calculator. I'm just throwing a standard on this trade and hoping it goes in my favor, right? And then what happens? You blow 80% of your account, basically a blown account. And then what happens? Right? You're, you're back to square one. You're back to that same rookie mindset, that same, making those same rookie mistakes, okay? So step one, this, write this down on your freaking whiteboard, guys. Step one is to master your mindset. Before you ever even think about investing even $100 into the market, before you ever even think about how much money you can make in the markets, you need to master your mindset or you will fail and lose every single penny you have invested. Every single time you'll blow your account if you cannot discipline and control your mindset and emotions. So what it boils down to at the end of the day, guys, short and sweet, okay? I'm going to be raw with you. Those of you guys that might be new here, I mean, I'm sure you're probably used to it by now because I've been, I've been doing it. A lot of you guys are new from since last week. You guys probably hear, hear how real and transparent I am. But I'm just going to be real with you at the end of the day, guys. I don't sugarcoat anything, okay? I'm not going to tell you, ah, oh, yeah, you know, this looks like a great trade. It's, it's guaranteed to win. Risk your entire account. And it makes me so sick because there's people out there that call themselves mentors that will tell people to do that. They'll people, oh, over leverage this trade. This trade looks better, right? No, it's not, it's, that's not how it works, right? I feel confident enough to risk more than 1% and risk 2% of my account, but that's as confident as I am on this trade, okay? That's as confident as I am is to risk 2%, right? There is no such thing as a guaranteed trade, a guaranteed win, right? If there was, then I would never use risk management, right? If there, were, if there was guaranteed trades that were 100% guaranteed to win, why would I not over leverage my account? Why would I not go put $10,000 or $100,000 in a brokerage account that has one to 3,000 leverage and leverage, you know, put 100 lots on a trade, right? If I knew it was guaranteed, why wouldn't I do that, right? But basic psychology is that there's no trade that's guaranteed. So you don't do that, right? People try to do that. That's why I always say leverage is a double-edged sword, right? You know, I'm, I'm very thankful that I don't have to trade on one-to-one -one leverage, 
that I'm able to use things like one to three leverage, one to 10 leverage, one to 25 leverage to be able to just, you know, just use a little bit of leverage to my advantage. But those brokers out there and that people are using one to 300, one to 500, one to 1000 leverage, you're only asking to blow your account. That's it. You know, that's why I hate, I, it's, it's like, it's like a huge pet peeve of mine when people message me and they ask me, David, do you know of a good broker that, that offers, you know, high leverage? You know what that tells me? Like, I don't even reply to those people because I just know that they don't have any concept of risk management. If it's, it's, it's such simple logic. If you use good risk management, you don't abuse leverage. You don't need high leverage. Right. So if you're coming to me saying, David, do you know, I, oh, I love, I love my one to 500 leverage. I, I, you know, oh, I don't like that broker because they only offer one to 200 leverage. You know what that tells me? It tells me that you don't like that broker because you like to risk a lot on your account. That's all it means, guys. It's so simple. Okay. So it, it, this is one way that you can filter out the fake. Okay. All right. Filter out the fakes out there. So I'm just keeping it real with you guys at the end of the day. Okay. This is how a professional trades. You don't, you don't look at going to a broker just because they have one to 500 leverage, okay? You go to a broker because they're regulated, all right? That's what I look for when, I, when I'm choosing a broker. That's why I trade with FX Choice. That's why with my prop account, I'm with a broker called Price Markets based out of the UK. Both brokers that I trade with that have, I have any sort of money invested with or any trading that happens, first and foremost, it happens on a regulated broker, okay? telling you right now, you might not like hearing this guys, but like straight up, if you're using traders way, if you're using Hugo's way, if you're using LQD FX, LMFX, JAFX, there's other ones out there too. Those are the main big ones that everybody's all hyped about right now. If you're using any of those brokers, stop, stop literally today, make a withdrawal from those brokers. The second we get off of this call and go and use a damn regulated broker. Like, why would you gamble your money that way, right? Why would you even risk? Like, you could wake up tomorrow and all your money could be out of your brokerage account. You could not be able to log into your account if you're with any of those brokers. And you know what's, what could happen? Nothing. You can't do anything. You can't do anything about it because they are not regulated brokers. You know, so this is just some, just some simple, basic logic, guys. If you guys don't understand these things, mindset being with a regulated broker, these types of basic things, you should not be investing real money. Simple as that, all right? You are still a complete novice, complete novice, if that's your mindset, if that's your way of thinking, all right? Straight up, like there's no other way to put it. Some of you guys might be rolling your eyes listening to this saying, David, you don't know what you're talking about. I made so much money with Trader's Way. I've withdrawn so much money with Trader's Way. Guys, What's happened in the past has no, no bearing on the present or the future. Okay. That goes with like a lot of things in life, right? Even like your, your past accomplishments have nothing to do with your present accomplishments or your future accomplishments, right? Maybe in some aspects, depending on what it is, you know, when it comes to trading, you know, I see, I see people being like, oh, remember, you know, three years ago, I flipped that account like crazy. So you're stuck in that mentality. It's like, it's almost, I don't, I don't say this last thing, guys, people get into that gambler's mentality, right? The worst thing that people can do when they come into Forex as a newbie is make a ton of money in the very beginning. Same thing with gambling, right? The worst thing that you can do is win a bunch of money the first couple times you go to the casino. Because then you're hooked on that easy money. You think it's always going to be that easy. And that's the problem with Forex trading is that people come in, they get lucky once or twice in their first six month period of trading, you know, taking a $500 account to $2,000 or something like that. And they get that shiny object syndrome. They get that flash in their eyes like, oh my God, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire next month. I'm going to be a millionaire this year. You know, to quit my job in, in next week, right? Because you get that shiny object syndrome and you forget that you got lucky, okay? That was zero skill. If you're still in your first six months of trading and you flipped an account, it's not skill, straight up. 
It's not skill. You got lucky. Your ass got lucky making that money. You got really lucky making that money. You have no skill. Okay. And I'm trying, I'm not trying to put you down, but like humble yourself sometimes guys, you know, like think about where you are. You're trying to like think that you've got the world's largest financial market. That's hard as shit to do mastered in six months. Like, no, it doesn't work like that guys, but your mind tricks you to thinking that's the way it works. Okay. So I think that that's enough motivation. Hopefully guys, please, at the end of the day, take what I say, you know, lightly, you know, I might know I might have like that tone where you like think I'm aggressive or this and that I'm just being real with you guys. All right. I'm just being real. It's not directed to each and every one of you. If you feel like it's directed to you, like, I don't know who you, you, I don't know you personally. I don't know your account personally. I don't know who you trade with. I don't know your story exactly. Right. So if it sounds like this is you personally, if everything I'm describing is something that you're doing right now or you're going through, then maybe, maybe take the hint that it's time to change. You know, it's as simple as that, all right? And, 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 and keep in mind, guys, I'm here to help you. You know, if, if you're real with yourself, I'm here to help you guys. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Right? I am here to help you on your journey. I'm here to help you thrive and become the best trader that you can be and be in this environment of real mentorship and real help. Right? But if you'd rather let your ego mask that and say, ah, David doesn't know what he's talking about. He only makes 2%, 3% in a month. You know, those are shitty gains. Well, I mean, see you in five years. You know, we'll see, we'll see where we are, we're, we're both at in five years. I know where I'll be at in five years because I've been doing this for the past five years. I already know what direction my life is going. I already know the direction I'm going in, right? There's something Ed Milet talked about in one of his podcasts today. And he talks about this. He talks about the speed at which people do things at, right? If you know something is going to like take a long time for you, it's like if you run a marathon, this is the example that, that Ed, Ed, Ed used, right? When you start a marathon, right? And maybe this isn't the best example because marathon, you kind of have to pace yourself out and stuff, but just, just bear with me when I say this, when you run a marathon, right? You, let's say the, uh, the marathon's what? Like, uh, let's say it's like eight miles, whatever. I don't even know what marathons actually are. Let's say it's like an eight mile marathon. Well, you, you know, in the beginning, you aren't going to run as fast. But when you're on that last half mile, you're on those last couple laps of that marathon, you're running your heart out because you know how close you are to the finish line. And that's what six and, and successful people take that concept of putting this concept in their head that they're close to the finish line, even if they know they aren't, that they pretend they tell themselves that they're close to the finish line. So they're always going at full pace. They're always going at full force, right? That's how you become a part of the 1% right? But it's the people that know that they're far away from their goals and like, in, in, in like say, Oh, I'm so far from it. I'll never get this close to my, you know, it'll take me so long to get to these goals that they jog, that they walk towards those goals. And that's why they never get ahead in life, right? Because they don't put a sense of urgency on their goals and on what they want to do. Okay. Hopefully that resonates with you guys. I know I've been like preaching a lot of Ed Milet. Like all I can say guys is if you don't listen to Ed Milet, like he is so amazing. He gives, he gives out so much value, you know, just, just give it a listen, search him out, search him up on like the podcast app. If you have it on your phone or YouTube or whatever, he's got a really, really great program. Um, I always listen to it when I'm taking a shower. I used to blast music when I was in the shower. Now I blast Ed Milan. You know, sometimes he does a dope interview with somebody and has like some really good knowledge on there. Other times it's just him just straight dropping bombs. Both are really great. Both I've gotten so much value from. So I would really, I would really uh, encourage all of you guys to uh, look up Ed Milet, you know, just check out some stuff that he does. Um, it's, it's crazy. This guy's built a multi, 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 multi million dollar company. Um, and is, is living proof of, of hard work. So it's pretty crazy. And he doesn't really have like, I mean, obviously he has things that he does, but, um, he doesn't have like a super hidden agenda, you know, like, uh, like somebody like Grant Cardone, right. He puts on, you guys know, 10 X growth con is this weekend, right. 10 X growth con is in a couple of days here, right. All 10 X growth con is, you know, not to, not to like 
talk crap on Grant Cardone or anything. He's, he's, he's brilliant at what he does. But if you go to, if you go to growth con, it's literally just a giant sales pitch. All you're sitting there for a couple of days, listening to sales pitches from other people selling their product, right? All of the speakers there are given a giant sales pitch, right? So, you know, I, I respect all of them for what they do. And, and there's people there that I love, like, uh, uh, actually Ed Milet is going to be there. Um, Russell Brunson is going to be there. You know, some of these guys that I consider like, uh, you know, social media mentors to me are going to be there. So I respect what they do. Um, but all I'm saying is like, you know, follow somebody that's like, if you're going to like take advice from somebody, take, take advice from somebody that's like actually going to do it. You know, I said last week, it's like people hire a financial advisor that makes like at the most high five figures a year. Right. So, so you're, you're, you go, you, how, how wacky, like what sense in what universe does this even sound like it makes sense that if you have money that you want to invest, you go hire a financial advisor that is making like $90,000, $80,000 a year. Somebody that's not even rich themselves, somebody that barely makes any money and you're trying to trust their opinion of what to invest in and they haven't even made it themselves. Like in what universe does that even make any sense? You know, I was listening to one of my friends today too. It's like listening to your parents, right? Like guys, when I first started Forex, guys, my parents were telling me you're going to fail. Like, I mean, they weren't like to my face, you're going to fail, you know, but they were dropping, dropping like subtle hints or my, my mom would always tell me every time I was on the phone with her, she's like, you know, so how's that Forex thing going? You know, you should really go get another job. You know, you should really go do another, you know, another thing. You should put all your eggs in one basket. What, what are my parents doing, right? My parents, a lot of you guys that may or may not know my personal situation, I'm, I'm an open book, guys. I'll tell you everything. I don't have anything to hide from you guys. My parents lost their business, right? My parents had a family-owned business uh, based out of uh, Arizona, and they built that. You know, my dad worked for, what, like 30, 30 plus years on this business, right? Before it was my dad's, it was my dad's dad's, and my dad's grandpa's is the person that started the business, right? It got handed all the way down. Were my parents ever rich? No. And then my parents ended up losing my bit, uh, the business. So why would you ever take advice from somebody that isn't where you are, right? It's like my friend was saying on his story today. He's like, if your mom is a great cook, well, then take her cooking advice, right? If she's an amazing, amazing cook, well, then yeah, take that cooking advice. But if, if your mom or your dad or your parents don't make money or aren't in a good financial situation or, or aren't where you want to be and you're taking advice from them, in what world does that even make any sense, right? Take advice. If you want financial advice, if you want financial freedom, if you want to be at a point of whatever you want to be financially, go learn from somebody that is where you want to be. It's so effing simple, right? But some people are like, especially with parents and family, right? You're so, I get it. You're so emotionally attached to your family. I love my parents. Right? I talk to my parents on a regular basis. I support my parents uh, financially. And I, but I, do I take financial investment advice from them? Do I listen to anything they say about finances? Hell effing no, I don't because they are nowhere near where I want to be. I'm taking care of them financially. How am I going to, they tell me to go and invest in something or do this and that. Why? Why? How does that make any, any logical sense in this world? Right? So, you know, there, there's been a lot of points and a lot of morals. I think of today's, uh, today's thing, but you know, one big takeaway is learn from somebody that has what you want. Right, the fastest way you're gonna get what you want is by learning from somebody that has it. All right, and like I'm not trying to say I'm some millionaire here. I'm not saying that I should be your only mentor. Right, that's why. Why do I? Why do I listen to Ed Milet? Right, because he's worth multi millions of dollars. He owns a multi multi million dollar company. Right, he's in a place where I see myself being in the next couple of years. Right, so. I'm obviously going to listen to whatever he says. I'm going to listen to anything that he says, any advice that he gives out. I'm going to take it to heart, right? One of the best things he said today, uh, one of the best, uh, lessons that he gave out today, I'm not going to go into it. You can go, you can go re listen to it for yourself, but he talks about fitting three days into one day. You know, he, he talks about how you can literally have three days of productivity. You can have three days in a one 24 hour period. Right. You guys should all, all go listen to that, that podcast. I think it was like out yesterday or whatever. I didn't get a chance to listen to it until today, but, um, it's, it's amazing. Right. And this guy's just dropping straight nuggets, straight bombs. And I'm going to take anything this guy says about financial advice or anything like that. And I'm going to listen to it because he's where I want to be.
right? I'm not going to listen to my grandpa. I'm not going to listen to my dad. I'm not going to listen to my mom. I'm not going to listen to my aunt, my uncle, everybody that's living an average life about finance and investing. <laughs> it makes no sense. Uh, Carlos says five years ago, if you started with $2,000 and only making on average 3% a month, you will, you will be over 100,000 today. Uh, no wonder David has over 100,000 personal accounts. Yeah, absolutely. It's the power of compounding. Learn how to compound your money, people. You won't take advice on how to lose weight from an overweight person. Yeah, it's perfect example, right? Perfect example. You want to lose weight? You're going to go talk to you know, your neighbor that's fat, sits on their ass and eats Cheetos and flips through Netflix all day long about gym advice? Right? No. You're going to go to the gym. You're going to find the most fit person. You're going to find somebody with your body type that's done what you want to do. And you're going to go learn from them. It makes sense. Right? Actually, you know, funny thing about that in, um, next Monday, um, I'm actually starting a 15 week program with, uh, a, a person that I met out here and he used to have the same body type as me, right? You guys have seen me. I don't know if any of you guys have, uh, some of you guys might not have seen photos. I mean, probably have, you know, I'm a very small dude. I'm, pr I'm pretty scrawny. And I've always been that way. It's just my body type. My metabolism is crazy, 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 crazy fast, right? Um, and I'm like 5'10 and like 135, 100, no, like 140 pounds. 5'10 and 140 pounds. I'm super skinny, right? My goal on my list at the beginning of this year was to gain 25 pounds, right? This guy's going to put me through a program where I gain 15 pounds in the next 15 weeks, right? I'm going to get over 50% of my goal in the next three months which is pretty awesome to me. I'm excited to do that type of thing, right? He's going to hold me accountable. He's going to make sure I'm eating the foods that I need to be eating, doing the workouts that I need to be doing, right? Doing everything that I need to do. Why, you know, why did I go and find him? Because he said, he shows me pictures of him two, three years ago, looking exactly like me. And now he's ripped. So it's like, I go and find somebody that had the same body type like me, that is where I want to be, and I learn from them. Simple, guys. Simple, 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 simple. But it's like some people are so disconnected to like the idea of like logical thinking like that, that they that they don't even they won't do something like that. You know, when it comes to like finance and stuff, right? So that goes for a lot of things too, guys. You know, I'll just leave you with this, and then and then and then I'll go. Um, this goes with like everything in life too. I'm not just saying with like forex and and working out. You know, it, it applies everywhere, right? The next time you think about the grass is greener on the other side or there's, a, there's this Forex company that's advertising 3,000 pips, do some research on the person running the group. Where are, that in, where are they in their life? What have they accomplished? What have they done? See where they're at. You know, and do that mental check. Be like, does this make sense? People can say a lot and they can make everything seem great and say whatever they want, but are they showing you what you want to do, right? Anybody, I'm not trying to like brag or boast, but anybody that goes and looks at what I'm doing or my lifestyle and what I've done, I've traveled the world the past year and a half. I've done, I've done exactly what I set out to do when I first started Forex, right? When I first started setting real goals for myself, I said, I want to travel the world. I want to drive a nice car. I want to live in a nice place, right? I drive the Mercedes I want. I live in a penthouse that I want, in a city I want. And I make the money I want. Well, I guess not want. I make good money, comfortable money. And I have traveled the world. I've achieved all of those goals. And you know what? I'm not satisfied. How does it made me feel fulfilled, right? I, I find more satisfaction and fulfillment. I feel more fulfilled when I, I get goosebumps when I'm telling you guys this type of stuff. Like when I'm, when I'm talking like this. Because this is what fulfills me right here. Is as soon as I get off this call, that, that feeling of fulfillment, knowing I'm impacting each and one of your, each one of your guys' lives in a positive way that motivates you to go out there and get it done. That is what fulfills me. All right. Not making money, not driving a nice car. You know, those things are great. It makes life easier to do, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill me. Fulfilling me is changing people's lives. So, Whew. That's the fire for today, guys. I told you guys this morning that today's uh, webinar was going to be fire or whenever a couple hours ago before this. I said I'm going to drop the fire today. All right. <laughs> all right, guys. So that's it. That's, that's all I have to say. That's what my heart feels. That's what my brain feels.
I just want to reciprocate all that. I hope you guys like all what I say resonates with you guys and is reciprocated well inside of each and every single one of you guys listening to this. All right. So, all right, guys, that's today's webinar. I appreciate you guys' time. I will see all of you on tomorrow's daily webinar, guys. I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Take care.